Well, good morning. My name is Gabriel Carlsen, Senior Director for FinTech and Digitalization at ICMA. I'm delighted to be joined by a panel of experts today to discuss the latest advancements in fixed income market innovation and how to maximize business performance or generate alpha. We've heard already about digital bonds and the, the search, kind of the, the development of the ecosystem, the important, the important milestones that have been achieved, um, not only in Switzerland, but also more broadly. But before we delve into the broader theme of automation across capital markets and what to expect going forward, perhaps we can start with a brief round of introductions. Lorenza. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Lorenza Di Cintio, and uh, I work for uh, Cassa Depositi and Prestiti, the Italian national promotional institutions uh, controlled by the Ministry of Finance. Um, within the CDP, I'm responsible for the capital markets funding activities and uh, to promote the sustainable finance uh, matters within the company. So, um, as uh, with CDP is a, as a frequent issuer has uh, around 15 billion euro bonds outstanding so far, so I will bring the issuer perspective to the discussion today. Thank you, Michael. Hi there, I'm Michael Cyrus. I'm responsible for collateral trading NFX uh, at Deca Bank. Um, we started um, blockchain DLT somewhere in 2017, 2018, uh, and we created a startup and uh, participated in the ECB trials. Uh, and uh, I'm also responsible for, for leading some of the digital initiatives in our capital markets uh, division of Deca Bank. Uh, Stephen Grady, I'm responsible for capital markets at Lombard Odia. Okay, my mics. Okay, back on. So we've just heard about the rise of digital bonds and the important evolution in this market segment, but arguably it is one specific area of capital markets. And if we look at the evolution of uh, technology more broadly and fixed income market innovation across issuance, trading, repo and collateral man management, securities lending, and also different types of instruments, whether it's rates, credit, green bonds, social bonds, sustainability linked bonds, or fixed income ETFs, in your view, kind of looking from a broader perspective, what are the most notable advancements when it comes to, um, to fixed income market innovation? Perhaps, Stephen, starting from your perspective. Um, I think there's probably <clears throat> three things, three themes that I'd, I'd draw on, Gabriel. The first, uh, and somewhat perhaps um, taken for granted now, is uh, data collection and, and uh, data passing um, tools, uh, particularly around secondary market trading. Um, we now use big data protocols to, um, to create, distribute, um, and analyze that data. And that's, that's really revolutionized secondary trading in lots of ways. A lot of the tools that we build around those markets now are really built around those, that fundamental building block. So that's the first sort of aspect, if you will. Second one, I think, really is around um, uh, secondary trading and trading automation. Uh, and that journey is kind of ongoing, if you will, and there's, there's certainly more bumps in the road than are often sort of presented. And the third one, obviously, is around sort of primary markets, if you will. Okay, I think that, that breaks it down and gives a bit of perspective on, on the different strands. Michael, what's your perspective on this? Well, I think um, we are currently going through a sea change, uh, also the sense that uh, the last uh, 10 years or probably the, dec the decade after the great financial crisis uh, to 2020 and into COVID was characterized uh, pretty much by uh, all kind of investment into regulatory initiatives. Yeah, I think all the banks and all the resources, in particular also the IT resources, uh, uh, were fully consumed uh, by regulatory initiatives. At the same time, um, we had the situation uh, that the interest rate situation uh, was weighing on the profitability, in particular, of European banks. Uh, so there was not much that uh, people could invest uh, into, let's say, uh, 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 innovation-driven uh, uh, initiatives from the front offices and I think that has changed uh, um, uh, which I just come from a uh, from a meeting uh, with uh, our CEO and he actually said well um, we are doing innovative stuff but uh, we can we also have the profitability uh, to sustain this sort of innovation and I think that is uh, that is a situation we did not really have uh, before 
Yeah, before it was really everything is going into fulfilling regulatory needs, and now um, we actually do see budgets being f uh, freed up uh, um, and investing into technological change. And I think that is, uh, and this is already making a major impact in, in terms of our infrastructure. Yeah. Okay, an interesting point, of course. When you say being able to, I guess, afford or invest into innovation, ideally it should be, I guess, self funding or there should be benefits from it. But it all depends on the perspective. Lorenza, from your perspective, what, what do you see as most notable advancements in, in recent years? Yes, so when, when we talk uh, more generally about uh, market innovation uh, in recent years, uh, specifically in debt capital markets, uh, it comes uh, to my mind inevitably sustainable finance, uh, the whole sustainable finance universe. Um, so back uh, in time, 10 years ago, at the very starting point, uh, Today we have uh, around 5 trillion of bond, uh, of sustainable bond uh, issued uh, globally. So I would maybe challenge the audience with this parallelism, uh, blockchain, distributed ledger technologies, uh, more generally, and asset tokenization uh, is uh, the most uh, um, notable advancement in, uh, in, uh, in capital markets in the last couple of years. So, without uh, repeating uh, uh, the, the, the first panel, but uh, I would like to stress that this could be really a breakthrough for financial markets, uh, as sustainable finance has been, maybe, perhaps uh, even uh, more, being uh, a more comprehensive, uh, um, uh, more comprehensive uh, potential. So um, in uh, CDP, we tested the, the, the application of these technologies with, uh, with our first digital bond issuances. Uh, we should uh, 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 25 million uh, euro private placement uh, on these uh, distributed ledger technologies on a public permissionless blockchain in July within the ECB exploratory work. So uh, the, 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 the point was that uh, the, the settlement uh, has been done with the central bank currencies and uh, via these uh, innovative uh, solutions from Bank of Italy, uh, solutions of so the tip slash link that uh, allowed a very smooth transfer of funds and we tested also a real-time uh, DVP mm -hmm. uh, settlement on the same trade date. So. Everybody, everything to just say that uh, this is uh, by far at the moment uh, one, uh, one of the most uh, uh, advancement that uh, from an initial perspective uh, we, we are looking at. Okay, that's interesting. I guess there's different, different views. There's the, I guess, big data angle on the one hand, availability of data um, and kind of continuous automation. We've heard in the previous panel that the drivers for digital bonds in particular there's different aspects. Some is around transparency. It's about efficiency, faster issuing, um, lower costs. In your view, what are the key drivers of those developments? Perhaps Lorenzo picking up on these points. Yes, indeed. So the key drivers for a mass adoption of such a, such a technologies uh, by the markets. Um, so we indeed test the benefits of uh, decentralization and these intermediations. So we, we, the, there wasn't any dealer bank between us and the final investor, nor CSDs. Uh, so, of course, it was a trial, it was a private placement, but we do believe that blockchain and uh, technologies has the potential to eliminate um, some steps uh, and burdens and costs that issuers has. Uh, as currently has on the traditional uh, uh, issuance process. Uh, so we are, maybe we are not uh, uh, looking at uh, um, a process where uh, there is no more intermediaries, of course, mm -hmm. uh, but maybe where intermedi intermediaries uh, act uh, with uh, a more value-added roles than uh, the one uh, that uh, we see now on a traditional uh, on a traditional process. So for sure, my advantages are related to the fastening, uh, reducing costs, uh, uh, and may also some risk relating, for example, to uh, the possibility of instant settlement. And um, yes, this uh, this is uh, the main. Uh, uh, the main uh, key drivers that uh, I think uh, will uh, 
uh, will help the massive adoption of uh, this kind mm -hmm. of uh, technology in the capital markets. Right. Okay, it's interesting to have, of course, the theme of, I guess, reducing risk. On the one hand, disintermediation is, I think, an important topic that, that, uh, that comes up in, in different contexts. Michael, wh what's your view as a, I guess, from your well, perspective? Well, I think... Um I mean, these are, at least from my perspective, these are relatively early days still. Yeah? So we also participated in the ECB trials. Uh, I think by now we have um, uh, uh, processed on our uh, platform something like 600 million in uh, digital assets. But actually, um, what we found out is, um, uh, for instance, when we talk to the savings, uh, it's not necessarily that they would say, okay, I love blockchain. Yeah, um, what, uh, what they actually are looking for is digitalization, yeah, because uh, in the issuance process, in particular um, uh, of some smaller uh, private placements, yeah, there's still a lot of manual workarounds. Uh, uh, people are still needing special document paper. They have to store the document paper at a special place. It did already happen in the past uh, uh, that documents were lost, uh, which is a problem because the document itself uh, is a proof that, uh, that somebody owes you money. Yeah, um, sometimes you, you need people yeah, who are traveling uh, 200 or 150 kilometers yeah, uh, to do the signature uh, under the documents. And what we actually did uh, to a large extent is that uh, we put all these kind of manual steps uh, and put it on a digital platform yeah, and then people can see from uh, the structuring of the asset towards the itch issuance and investing into the assets, where is the asset yeah, and who is currently responsible for it, and then they can immediately take the box. So processes that usually take something like uh, 10 to 15 days or more yeah, can be collapsed into something like, okay, we sit down yeah, in the morning yeah, and then we just make it happen. Yeah, and everybody is sitting um, and then in front of, um, uh, of the screen. Yeah, and this is something where I actually said it's more like digitalization happening on a blockchain. Uh, so people would have probably bought uh, um, uh, the idea of digitalization, but blockchain gives them uh, um, also an, another means to, to go into that area. Now, um, in order to, to really start scaling, yeah, I think um, what, we, what we are now in is a, is a very critical juncture in the sense that uh, for the first time with the ECB we have used um, central bank money. Yeah, and central bank money does have um, uh, uh, some consequences in the sense that you eliminate settlement risk, that if money and assets are on the same platform, you actually will allow for all kind of netting benefits mm -hmm. uh, in liquidity netting, in capital uh, netting, in balance sheet netting, all kind of things that we currently do not have. Yeah, and this is why uh, it's now important to, uh, to get a more scalable solution, yeah, not only yeah, for central bank money, because as long as we talk central bank money, we are always only talking about um, uh, payment processes, but actually also uh, talking about commercial bank money in the next step, you know, because commercial bank money is where business models of banks usually reside. Yeah? And only if we have this step, yeah, then we can actually um, uh, go the last step to fulfill what blockchain has promised, at least in my view, and that is smart contracts. Uh, when you have smart contracts, you will be able to, uh, to code uh, from the issuance to the maturity uh, event uh, the complete assets, and then you will get actually um, the user benefits that actually everybody is promising when we are talking about blockchain. But you see, this is still quite a journey. Yeah, and yeah. we also saw that people in other markets with other technologies uh, are also developing quite fast. Uh, and in the end, as I said, I think um, people will not just buy blockchain because it's blockchain. Uh, they will buy the package that will give them the, uh, the biggest economic benefit. Uh, and, and that is the race uh, that we are currently in, I think. So ultimately, there's, I guess, the, the process efficiency at play. There's capital efficiency and ultimately that it's, it's profitable. Stephen, from your perspective, and I guess the, the, the buy side has a key role to play on the one hand, but you've also been on the other side working for a, an incumbent technology provider in the primary space. What are the key drivers and, and who's driving the change from your perspective? Yeah, I, I'd like, if I could sort of pick up on sort of my, some of Michael's points there. I think that the evangelist sort of practitioners um, 
don't necessarily need to be given more evidence as to the efficacy of the technology. I don't think this is necessarily a technology question. However, what I think it is a question of is community building, right? Yeah. So, so it's a community building exercise and communities will only build as quickly as the slowest, slowest moving amongst those. Mm -hmm. So amongst that, that um, cohort, if you will, we're still very much in proof of concept phase and actually we're in education phase in, in many instances. And so uh, I think that, that perhaps more emphasis needs to be placed on that, that, that community building aspect. We're leading with the technology rather than the solution provision that it provides. And I think that that's, that's, that's really critical. I think that, that that sort of plays itself out in some of the other aspects around sort of secondary trading, if you will. If I think of the way that secondary trading is automated on the outside, again, it's a sort of shiny solution to go and automate all of your trading and that gives you efficiency gains and, all, and everything that comes along with that. But actually when you go through the, the process of doing it, it's less, um, uh, it's less ready to wear and more bespoke, if you will, when you go and sort of build that. So we've... We've done a lot of work over the last couple of years in terms of automating our secondary trading. What we sort of found is that different uh, counterparties um, price different universes of bonds. They price them at different times. They connect to venues in different ways and have an ability to engage with clients differently. So your experience of them and your ability to progress quickly and at speed is really down to an awful lot of work that goes on behind the scenes in order to build that. And I, and I would suspect that the, the, the journey to digital bond issuance and distribution is going to be very sort of similar, if you will, mm -hmm. that it won't be as turnkey as, as we would like it to, to be, and really the devil is in, is in the detail. So creating those journeys or pathways to migration is very important. So the fungibility that was referred to on the, yeah. on the former panel I think is a really critical aspect, and I think that... You know, without being biased, being based in Switzerland, I think the work that SEX is doing is important in that regard, but I think it will require a lot more of the participants to engage proactively. One of the difficulties, of course, is that the status quo has a lot of stakeholders who've got a vested interest in maintaining that, so how can they be, how can they be um, uh, brought along that journey as well, which is, which is really important. So if you think of those three major groupings of issuers, um, uh, banks and uh, investors, how can you migrate those, those, um, uh, those groups across into that digital world? I think is really where the, where the focus needs to be is how do each of those interact in a, in a more digitally, uh, digital world than, than we have currently. I think the, the aspect of community building certainly is critical and that is not true, I guess, only for let's say digital bonds, but more broadly on the automation journey across different, different asset classes um, and instruments more broadly. From an initial perspective, uh, Lorenza, in terms of going back to challenges and risks, from your perspective, when it comes to automating processes, what are the key challenges and how do you navigate these? So uh, we, within our uh, trial and within our uh, experience on uh, digital securities, we um, we highlighted some uh, challenges and constraints that uh, I think we, uh, we will need to be managed and addressed. So firstly, uh, who will embrace the role of the infrastructure manager, uh, and the, uh, like the registry uh, manager, the infrastructure operator. So in our uh, business case, we acted as a registry manager for our own transaction, but it was just to let's say, test the whole process, uh, but we do believe that other type of market participants should provide this service. And uh, most important uh, uh, is the interoperability uh, among both platforms, uh, technological platforms and legacy systems um, in order to avoid the risk of, um, uh, I would say, being um, too much dependent of one uh, technological platform. Mm -hmm. um, also, the, inter the, the integration of the uh, whole uh, aspect uh, uh, related to legal matters, documentation, uh, uh, or maybe also from a disclosure prospectus within uh, the, um, the, the DLT, so within the on-chain part of the, of the process. Um, last but not least, uh, the definition of a tax framework for digital securities that is in line, that should be in line with the with that uh, uh, for of uh, non-digital uh, uh, securities. 
So all of these uh, challenges and risks uh, is, uh, should be managed and addressed in order to uh, avoid the risk of hindering us uh, uh, liquid and uh, active secondary market development. Mm -hmm. We we have uh, we have uh, we heard in the first panel the importance of uh, having a active secondary market mm -hmm. for this kind of securities. So um, we see significant advantages uh, in uh, in uh, how uh, issuances and uh, primary markets can be executed with uh, with these new technologies. Um, so. But again, all of this aspect needs to be managed. So maybe uh, the question is not uh, uh, if or when, uh, but how these uh, technologies will uh, uh, will explore on the, on the market in the coming uh, uh, years, five years. Okay, I think the important <laughs> aspects, and probably also, I guess, too, from your perspective, Michael, you mentioned you also looking there's different strands. There's on the one hand blockchain, on the other hand there's simply data and and automation. <laughs> What do you see as key challenges and, and risks and, and how to navigate these? Well, I think uh, some of the challenges is that in particular at the beginning of a, uh, of a new innovation, you need a lot of um, domain specialists. And these domain specialists uh, um, need to talk to, to the people who have the um, uh, know-how about this new technology. Yeah, and I think creating that link is, uh, is also something that we um, sometimes find quite challenging. Yeah, um, so because uh, you have a couple of people, you know, for instance, also in the reposec lending business, they have been doing their business for 15 or 20 years. And of course, there have been incremental changes. Yeah, um, what is now probably coming is not so much of an incremental change. It is um, you have to do your business in a different way. Uh, and, um, and I think um, this is something where, where we need to educate people. Yeah, and um, it is also something where we have to experiment. Uh, and also, this is something, um, when, when you take um, a flow trader, uh, uh, experiments are not something that a flow trader would be uh, used to do and uh, that he would be uh, very open uh, uh, to engage with. Yeah? So, uh, because, uh, and we, we have the, all these kind of discussions. Yeah? So we, for instance, currently are introducing uh, a weaker form of AI, large language model, uh, in, in our uh, repo trading. Um, uh, department. Uh, so the idea is that uh, when people are sending out their locates, uh, then the AI will read out uh, um, among, hi, how are you, yeah, how was yesterday, blah, 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 yeah, and then he will pick out um, uh, out of this locate as a relevant information for, for, for transaction. He will download it into the trading system. The trading system will immediately look, okay, do we have these securities available? Yeah, and then um, he will, uh, the trading system will immediately uh, make a trading proposal yeah, um, and, the, and the trader um, will be able to see um, uh, uh, the proposal and then probably execute it right away. Yeah, and, and these are kind of things which, um, um, uh, uh, which we already see uh, can save at the moment something like half an hour per day. That doesn't sound that much, yeah, but it's also like, okay, it's also like uh, uh, two hours being spent uh, talking with the IT guys uh, because uh, there are a lot of mails um, where the process did not work. Yeah? So you have mm -hmm. to train it. So and you actually you're not tr only training uh, the artificial intelligence or the machine learning module, uh, but you also have to train uh, the IT guys doing it, and you have to train yeah, um, uh, the front office guys um, who are who are then working with it. Yeah, and then. Uh, when we have done that, uh, there's the next step, uh, for instance, in terms of pricing. Uh, in particular, uh, when you take a look in uh, what regulators have done uh, the last uh, couple of years, uh, they have amassed in these kind of trade repositories all kind of data. And I always said, okay, it's, it's just like a dump of data and nobody's using it. Yeah, I think also um, uh, with some domain specialists, we are now at a situation that, um, at least in some cases, you can start making sense out of this data. Yeah, and you can analyze the data to get a better and clearer picture yeah, of uh, certain areas uh, where securities trade at different prices, something that according to the law of one price, yeah, so in capital markets everybody would say no, that is not, uh, not necessarily something we would expect, but we actually do see that there is structure in the market uh, where certain um, segments of the markets are trading uh, clearly at different prices. 
Yeah, so and then the idea is, of course, uh, that uh, we link this machine uh, um, uh, then also uh, into into a pricing um, engine where we analyze these kind of trading patterns, so that the trader not only gets a trade proposal for the security, uh, he also gets a, a, a proposal uh, for the price at which. Well, the machine and he himself probably thinks that this could be a good deal. Yeah. So, and, and these are yeah. all kind of you have, really have to think new. You have to you have to create bridges. Uh, um, uh, you have to to think in networks. Yeah. And I said that is probably not the strengths of, of people who have been working in silos for 15, 20 years. So. I think that sounds indeed very promising. But of course, it's a cultural shift, also mind shift, to to adapt to that. And I think it's kind of forward looking. It's a segue, I guess, because the speed of technology seems to be ever increasing when we hear about AI-powered chatbots that are also applied in capital markets and whether it's for trading or identified trading <coughs> opportunities on the one hand, but also the evolution of e-trading or automation of workflows. Yet it is, I guess, onboarding solution does take time, um, onboarding, integration, and so on. And the question is, what are the real opportunities looking ahead? And this is not so much, I guess, the latest developments, but more forward glancing, Stephen, from your perspective, how do you see this and, and what do you think of, of Michael's thoughts? Yeah. Uh, I think the distinction between sort of technology and and trading mm -hmm. is is breaking down very quickly, and and I think the existence of keeping them in separate silos makes less and less sense. And we have people who sit within our groups now that are either data specialists or technology specialists, and the distinction between them and traders they're starting to become blended. Right, so yeah. we have some already, but we have some. You know, I'd, I'd say that it's sort of on a journey from, from being two separate areas to, to one, if you will. I think a lot of the work that we're trying to think about too is, is instead of trying to look at data in a backward fashion and to optimise on that basis, we're starting to think about, okay, where we're starting to work on trying to anticipate. So instead of um, asking who's, had, who's been uh, a liquidity provider in the past, who's likely to be a stronger liquidity provider today and tomorrow and what have you. So there's patterns that you can observe that you can start to anticipate and I think a lot of the big data work that we're trying to do is really starting to think about, well, what does optimal look like sort of tomorrow, if you will. So you're skating, so to, so to speak, to where the puck is going to be, not where it is. And I think that that's informing a lot of our thinking at the moment in terms of how we think about much similar to some of the aspects that Michael was touching on. Okay, that's interesting because, of course, I think data is key and it's, I guess, the lifeblood ultimately for many capital markets activities. What are your thoughts, Lorenza, on this? Yeah, so looking, looking forward, uh, for sure, uh, AI data analysis uh, is definitely transforming the uh, how data is managed, the use uh, and uh, analyze. So from an initial perspective, uh, uh, these new uh, tools can be uh, useful for, uh, for example, for a custom performances, uh, as well as uh, investors' demand, uh, ultimately uh, allowing uh, uh, issuers to, um, to have a better uh, planning of its uh, funding uh, uh, of its funding activities uh, and uh, to uh, match uh, um, in a better way the investors' demand uh, that uh, at the eventually can uh, can bring uh, an, uh, to to maximize uh, the success of uh, the single transaction on primary market. Uh, but also, uh, given the consolidation of the sustainable finance, uh, the using and the um, utilization of the AI uh, and machine learning uh, or automating process uh, uh, for ESG data is, uh, is, uh, is crucial and is, uh, it can be a very, very important uh, uh, development uh, in, this, uh, in this area uh, in order to help both uh, issuer from one side to uh, collecting the ESG data of, uh, for example, for uh, um, reporting the impacts of uh, its ESG bonds, and on the other side, from the investor side, uh, uh, helping the investor to have a more uh, um, transparent and, um, uh, I would say, um, automated uh, data uh, in order to uh, to check the sustainability claims of the uh, of the of the bonds of the ESG bonds that has in uh, in their portfolio. So these are uh, two, uh, maybe two um, 
uh, to view of on the on the capital markets uh, in using the mm -hmm. AI data data driven analysis. That is indeed a very interesting perspective, perspective, I think, especially from an ESG or sustainable finance perspective, because indeed data here is critical both for impact reporting under regulatory obliga um, reporting obligations. And we will dive into this in more detail in a panel later today, which is going to be moderated by my colleague Nicholas Puff. Um, so I think more to follow on this. In the interest of time, perhaps from your perspective, what are the key lessons you would like to share uh, when it comes to fixed income market innovation and technology. And then we can take, I, I guess, a few, a few questions as well. Stephen. Yeah, uh, uh, as I was alluding to sort of earlier, I think it's very much um, a, a function of doing a lot of sort of forward planning, if you will. The transitions are not as fast as, uh, as, as you anticipate, and there's a lot more work that needs to go into architecting um, automation journeys and how you're thinking about your utilization of data, if you will. So um, I think that that's, that's kind of a critical aspect and the lead times are perhaps longer than you would like them to be. So th I think that's, that's kind of one of the big lessons that we've taken away from our journey. Thank you. Michael. I think uh, we have a motto in, uh, in capital markets and, and that is first transaction on the book. Uh, and the, the idea behind it is um, that uh, it usually doesn't pay if, if you come up with a uh, theoretical uh, approach to it and then just uh, try to, to think it through from the beginning towards the end. Uh, because uh, in particular in, the, in these areas where we are currently in, uh, um, we don't have all the knowledge that would allow us to do uh, such a great plan. Uh, and this is actually where we try to focus, um, where, we, uh, where we have um, a new ideas. Yeah, we immediately try to focus people on finding a transaction. Uh, um, because in finding a transaction, you also need to talk uh, to people in the market uh, and see whether you're not the only one uh, um, to find out that this probably makes sense. Because otherwise it does happen, and I think it did happen uh, in our bank and probably also in other banks, uh, um, uh, you sometimes have these enthusiasts, these uh, uh, new product enthusiasts, and they just start running. Uh, and, and they should start running, and there is no transaction forthcoming after one year or two years. Uh, and, uh, and then probably at some stage people will say, okay, I had enough. Yeah, so also in order to get the buy-in of, uh, of management and others, I think it's important to focus uh, on what we can do best and the end, at the end there has to be a transaction uh, and uh, this is what we try to instill in people right from the beginning. Yeah. Great. Last but not least, Lorenza. Yeah, so we've seen that uh, the evolution of DLTs and uh, also the central bank digital currencies uh, development will uh, uh, transform the, the whole life cycle of uh, bond issuances, uh, but also tokenization of bonds uh, um, is, uh, can really revolutionize the, the liquidity of the, of the fixed income market. Tokenization is a kind of, uh, we can say, the democratization of, uh, um, uh, within, the, within the market uh, uh, due to the fact that uh, uh, all those uh, further investors, even uh, um, retail investors, or uh, not necessarily retail, I would say maybe just uh, smaller investors to, mm -hmm. to access uh, uh, primary market and secondary market, of course. Um, so these are uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from uh, the, the lessons learned from our side, but for sure, uh, standardization uh, is needed in order to uh, develop uh, uh, in an efficient way such mm -hmm. a technologies, both from a technology point of view and both, of course, from the regulatory uh, aspect. Right. Well, thank you very much for sharing these invaluable insights, which I hope will be useful for the audience. Of course, everybody is at a slightly different different stage in the journey. Nonetheless, I think it is a theme that is not going away, that is manifesting itself in many different facets of the market, so one that is of, of critical importance.